Good morning to everyone watching to, and all our participants on today's COVID-19 public health briefing. It's been an eventful and important week in Fargo Metro in our fight against COVID-19. There have been some major updates recently in regards to reopening efforts across North Dakota, as well as mass testing events near the Fargo Dome this weekend. Given how quickly things have been moving recently, I want to take a moment to thank all our local leaders and healthcare experts for joining the briefing virtually today. Our communities need your expertise more now than ever. With that, I would like to introduce Desi Fleming, Director of Fargo Cast Public Health. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, everyone. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has required an array of testing strategies. As the mayor mentioned, the North Dakota Department of Health, Local Public Health, and the North Dakota National Guard held a mass testing event at the Fargo Dome this past weekend, in which over 1,000 people were tested. Also, there continues to be more long-term care facilities in our area, and this remains a very high-risk group for COVID complications and serious impacts. At the state level, there is a testing task force that is determining testing locations and strategies, along with guidance from the CDC team. We do anticipate more testing efforts in our area given the governor's push for overall increased in testing. The North Dakota Department of Health is prioritizing diagnostic testing with their supplies versus mass public testing events. Fargo Cast Public Health continues to do contact tracing. We currently have over 30 staff assisting with this effort. NPR recently released a report based on surveys and data from NACHO identifying states that are meeting contact tracing needs. And North Dakota was the only state currently meeting this metric. So kudos to my team for their part in that effort. As a reminder, contact tracing helps to identify close contacts to positive cases and then quarantine and monitor those individuals who may have had an exposure. Identifying these individuals early helps us to limit the spread of COVID. CDC has also recently added to their list of COVID-19 symptoms in which testing would be indicated. Symptoms typically appear two to 14 days after exposure to the virus. People with respiratory symptoms of cough, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing may indicate a COVID-19 infection or at least two of the following symptoms, fever, chills, repeated shaking with chills, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, or loss of taste or smell. People with COVID-19 have had a variety of symptoms reported ranging from mild to severe illness, as well as to asymptomatic, which basically means they experience no symptoms at all. All of these have been shown to spread the virus. In our area, there have been identified community spread and the presence of asymptomatic positive cases, which is why it's really important for people to continue to use cloth face coverings when in public places, such as grocery stores where physical distancing is challenging and others may congregate. If you have mild symptoms or are asymptomatic, the face coverings will help decrease the chance of you spreading the virus. The face coverings limit the transmission of respiratory droplets you may spread when speaking, coughing, or laughing. So please be a good neighbor and continue to wear face coverings when you're in public. As of yesterday, there are 991 positive cases in North Dakota. 48% of those cases are in Cass County. 19 people have died from this virus and 14 of those are in our county. Community spread and close contacts make up 72% of Cass County cases. So as things start to open back up, we need to be aware of the potential consequences if we fall back into old routines or become complacent. All of us must take personal responsibility to be fully aware of our surroundings, use good judgment, remain diligent with prevention practices. And again, those include the physical distancing, hand hygiene, disinfecting practices, staying home when you're sick, and having a face covering ready and available when needed. As I had said last week, these practices need to be our new behavioral norm going forward. If we don't play this smart, we will likely see the virus quickly increasing in spread, again, causing us to play catch up, which given the known impact of this virus on our most vulnerable citizens is something that we just can't afford to do. If there's one thing that's very apparent during this pandemic, people react to situations in very different ways. With the thought of people returning to work and restrictions loosening, you really see a wide range of emotions from relief to fear or panic. Everyone responds to stress differently based on their perceptions and on their individual coping skills. 
We all need to respect each other and to be aware of the impact this is having on mental health. The mission of public health is to prevent, promote, and protect. In carrying out that mission, we work together with our diverse community and have the unique opportunity to meet people where they are, provide factual information, acknowledge their opinions, and guide them in any way we can towards positive change. Now is the time to find common ground, support each other regardless of our views, economics, or life experiences. We need to be kind and accepting of differences in order to join together in a continued collective effort to protect our most vulnerable community members. All it takes is deliberate and thoughtful actions going forward. Be that good neighbor. Thank you. Thank you, Desi. Next, we'll have Clay County Public Health, Kathy McKay. Thank you, Mary, Mayor Mahoney, and uh, good morning, everyone. On Minnesota numbers, uh, we're almost uh, 4,200 positive cases. About 2,000 are out of isolation, and there's 301 deaths throughout the state of Minnesota. Our Clay County numbers, we have 149 positive cases. We have 10 deaths. Our median age is around 51. And again, we're seeing the congregate living centers um, having exposures, and of course, we have a lot of community spread. On April 25th, Governor Walls signed an executive order authorizing out-of-state healthcare professionals to render aid in Minnesota during this COVID peacetime emergency. The executive order allows Minnesota healthcare entities, including long-term care and other congregate living facilities, to engage healthcare providers from all other states to assist with providing care and filling staffing needs in their facilities. This executive order applies to individuals who would normally have to obtain a license from the Minnesota Medical Board or the Minnesota Board of Nursing. Nurses and other medical professionals licensed in any other state may use their current license to work in Minnesota healthcare facilities. This is very important across the state of Minnesota so the healthcare facilities can hire temporary qualified staff in order to respond quickly to the healthcare worker shortages during this pandemic. Minnesota Responds Medical Reserve Corps is a partnership that engages local, regional, and statewide volunteer programs to strengthen public health and healthcare. Currently, Clay County is looking for individuals with healthcare experience to work in congregate care settings. Opportunities include both direct patient care and support roles. If you're interested, interested in registering, visit minnesotaresponse.org or check out Clay County Public Health Facebook page for information. On April 22nd, Governor Walls and some representatives of healthcare delivery systems, the Mayo Clinic, University of Minnesota, announced a breakthrough for rapid widespread testing of COVID-19 in Minnesota to test all symptomatic people, isolate confirmed cases, and expand public health surveillance tools. By building capacity to test as many as 20,000 Minnesotans per day, this increased testing and tracing will support the state's response to the pandemic and the safe reopening of public and private businesses. Minnesota created a screening tool online and it's designed to help people decide whether they should be tested for COVID-19. Visit minnesota.gov forward slash COVID-19 for more information and to view testing locations. Most of the testing for Clay County continues to be completed through the healthcare facilities in Fargo. This week is National Infant Immunization Week. It's from April 25th through May 2nd, annually highlighting the importance of protecting children two years and younger from vaccine preventable diseases. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind the public of the importance of routine infant immunizations. The CDC reminds families of the major achievements highlighted by controlling vaccine preventable diseases worldwide. Vaccines have drastically reduced infant deaths and disability caused by preventable diseases in the United States. Through immunizations, we can now protect infants and children from 14 vaccine preventable diseases before the age of two. 
During this COVID pandemic, we do not want vaccination coverage to wane and increase the risk for outbreaks of vaccine preventable diseases. So we want to remind parents to be sure to keep your infants on schedule for their vaccinations. And please follow your healthcare provider's guidance for scheduling infant vaccinations. As a community, we've made progress in slowing the spread of COVID-19 through our social distancing and other public health measures. We know this has been difficult and challenging for everyone. We know and are aware of all the stress involved, but we wanna remind people we need to continue our work together and protect the most vulnerable citizens in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Our next speaker is from Sanford Fargo, Dr. Doug Griffin. Is he coming on here? Can, can you hear me now? Now we can, yes. Okay. We, we need to work this one out a little bit. But anyway, <laughs> um, uh, so thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to um, uh, provide some information about what's going on here at Sanford uh, here. So currently we are caring for 23 patients uh, in our special care unit uh, with COVID-19. We've had uh, 36 employees, many whom have recovered uh, that had acquired uh, COVID-19, but none of them have acquired it by care of COVID-19 patients. It's all been acquired within the community. I especially want to thank our nurses and physicians and other frontline healthcare workers who continue to care for these patients. And I want to thank everyone who's worked hard to keep us well prepared uh, for a surge of patients uh, and beyond. We're excited to, to announce the uh, home monitoring program, which we've stood up this week for higher risk patients that have positive COVID-19 diagnosis. In this program, patients can measure and report their temperature and oxygen levels while receiving the support of a specially trained nursing team. The home monitoring program will help patients who can safely be cared for in their homes and have peace of mind while they're recovering. Our drive-through COVID testing continues to run smoothly. We continue to test more than 150 people daily. Uh, we'll continue to offer antibody testing through Mayo and soon via our laboratory as well. Um, and we expect to have the capacity to do 1,200 tests daily. As we look ahead to what our new normal will be, and I know Dr. Vetter will speak a little bit about the antibody test as well, this will be important to help us understand the disease and how better to manage it. While we presume the presence of the IgG antibody is protective, medical science just doesn't know this for sure yet, so we need more information on that. I also want to lift up, we still see people delaying their health care. This also results in serious health challenges. For example, at our cancer center, we normally see several new cancer diagnoses each week because of screening efforts. But because these screening efforts have not been happening regularly, we are not seeing these cancers delaying their care. At our children's care clinics, we are not seeing kids for immunizations. And in fact, uh, in our footprint, one uh, area has reported a 40% decrease in measles immunizations. And we all recall recent measles outbreak from unimmunized. And patients are sicker because they're waiting too long to see a doctor. Sanford has continued to provide exceptional and safe care for thousands of patients in our facility during this week. We've been meeting the needs of COVID-19 patients. So we want to make it known it is safe to receive care and to remind people not to delay necessary clinic visits, including preventive screenings. Our commitment is to continue to keep patients and staff safe. We have implemented aggressive safety measures designed to prevent the transmission of the virus. And we've also created a strategy and process to test asymptomatic patients prior to scheduled procedures such as surgery. We know now that COVID-19 will continue to be present in our communities for quite some time. We are well prepared to continue to care for COVID-19 patients while also getting back to caring for your regular medical needs. I would also like to highlight that this is World Immunization Week 
and it is widely recognized that immunizations are one of the most successful and cost-effective health in interventions. And we only have to look at the impact of one new virus uh, to understand the importance of getting immunizations to you and your loved ones. So please don't put off receiving care. Reach out to your provider to discuss the right health care treatment and options for you and your loved ones. And for more information, you can visit our website at SanfordHealth.org or Sanford Health News Online. I want to close with uh, saying a thank you for those who have donated cloth masks, mask mates, and disinfecting wipes. They're all distributed as soon as they come in, so keep them coming. We're still very much in need of them and very appreciated. We're also honored this week to announce that we have raised from internal donations more than $1 million for our Sanford Employee Crisis Fund. 100% of these funds go directly to our frontline staff who are struggling during this time and need a little help. I continue to be amazed and humbled by the generosity of our employees and our communities. We are truly stronger together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Our next speaker will be Dr. Rich Vetter from Essentia Health. Great, good morning, thank you, and good, uh, Mayor Mahoney. Um, as we look forward to the opening of our businesses and resume more normal activities, I know one thing that's on top of everyone's mind is about the availability, availability and indications for the various testing platforms. Uh, I'd like to provide just a brief update of where we are at Essential Health with our testing capabilities. So a few weeks ago, we implemented our in-house rapid testing that we have available, and this is to identify acute COVID infections. We have a turnaround time of about 45 to 60 minutes for that test. However, still have some limitations in the supply of that uh, test, and so we still are using the North Dakota Department of Health as well as Mayo Clinic reference labs uh, for t acute testing as well. Uh, the turnaround time for those is 24 to 72 hours. This past week, we also added the uh, av availability of antibody testing that we can get through our Mayo Clinic reference lab. Just wanted to talk a little bit more detail about these tests. So as a reminder, for acute infection or those people that are having symptoms, uh, we still use, as uh, Desi said, the North Dakota Department of Health guidance that was updated yesterday, which actually liberalized the testing criteria to one symptom or a combination of two lesser symptoms. And then also we are utilizing that for contact tracing for those who've been in contact with a COVID positive 19 patient and are having symptoms. The antibody test is really used more to look for antibodies that a person will develop after they've had a recent infection. Just wanna send out some precautions. There's a lot of hype around this antibody test. Um, we do know that um, there's some limited validation has been done with some of these tests due to the FDA fast tracking process. And so there's still a lot that needs to be learned about the accuracy uh, and the utility of those tests. We do know that you have to have had symptoms for at least 14 days um, before those tests will start to turn positive. And while they do tell you about a possible exposure, they do not indicate uh, immunity, at least at this time, we're not 100% um, sure of that. The other thing that I wanted to reference is this idea of false positives and false negatives. So a false positive test is basically a test that is positive even though you don't have the disease. And that could be due to cross-reactivity to other viral antibodies. A false negative test would say that you don't have the illness when in fact you do. Uh, and that could be based on the timing of when you're doing that testing, for example. So again, these tests are not as accurate as we typically are used to testing because of the rapid availability of them. As time passes, they'll get more and more uh, precise uh, and we'll have better utility in knowing how to use them. But again, for now, we do not want people to assume that they indicate immunity until we have further guidance on that. So we do not want to use these at this time either for return to work uh, indications either. So could you pull up the first slide for me? I have a couple slides I was going to share today and just kind of walk through. Um, as we've talked the last couple of weeks, I've talked about this issue of unintended consequences and Dr. Griffin touched on this as well. Um, the slide that we have up um, is really kind of to help us understand better the multiple effects that a pandemic represents. There's a first wave, which is really the acute infection for those picky at high risk that might require hospitalization or ICU care. 
This can result in a significant morbidity, hospitalization, as I mentioned, uh, and even if severe, can result in death. Following this, there's a first wave tail, which is really that post-recovery period where people are out of the ICU, might be out of the hospital, but still have significant health effects from the effects of that acute infection. We know that about 20% of patients will have uh, cardiac issues. Uh, there's been recent reports of increased risks of blood clots, stroke, other infections, uh, and just overall deconditioning from being in a, a ICU setting. So these patients will continue to need ongoing treatment uh, and recovery. The second wave that's depicted on this slide talks about the impact of resource restriction on those urgent or non-COVID conditions. And this we've been seeing more and more as well as Dr. Griffin explained for that those people who are delaying or postponing the care that they really need for those urgent or time sensitive non-COVID related conditions. The third wave is really the impact of interrupted care on chronic conditions, for example, diabetes, heart, disease, um, uh, lung disease, uh, other surveillance testing and screening testing. And it's really that first and third wave that we really want to make sure that people know that we do have access for them for our clinical services and we want people to uh, be reaching out for those for those necessary procedures and diagnostic tests that they need and to remind people that our emergency rooms and urgent cares are available as well. And I'll talk a little bit more uh, in a minute here about what we're doing at Essentia, just like at other healthcare organizations, to make that care as safe as possible. And then finally, the fourth wave, there's really those behavioral health effects uh, and the impact on mental illness and the economic impact that as these, um, as this uh, condition continues to work through our community, um, the impact that it can have over the longer term. So we are in the process of implementing wellness programs, behavioral health support for our staff, and we just wanna encourage patients and their families to reach out uh, to their healthcare provider uh, if they are experiencing any of those difficulties. Also wanna just take a few minutes uh, to reassure the public as well of what we're doing at Essentia uh, to keep our clinics and hospitals safe for patients and staff. First of all, uh, we're gonna to continue to screen all of our patients, staff, visitors that are entering our facilities. For some of those invasive procedures or testing, we're doing per uh, perioperative testing uh, 72 hours in advance for those that uh, we can plan for or rapid in-house testing for those that are more urgent or emergent. Second, um, we're changing our facilities physical spaces to better uh, provide for that social separation. For example, you probably notice if you've been in to a lot of different uh, places, there's feet on the floor, signage up to remind people to keep separated, uh, better chair separation in our waiting areas. Uh, third, we have universal masking of our patients and staff, and this is really meant to, again, protect our patients from asymptomatic uh, uh, people. Fourth, uh, the cleaning. Uh, we're spending a lot more time cleaning our exam rooms, our equipment, our waiting areas multiple times a day, including countertops, computers, doorknobs. Uh, I made a comment the other day to someone that I think our healthcare facilities are probably cleaner now than I've ever witnessed them. So again, just want to reinforce that to people. Uh, and then finally, we're also staggering uh, in-person visits with virtual visits. So to try to space out the way patients are coming into the clinics uh, to make uh, less exposure. Uh, finally, I have one other slide I wanted to just share, and this was really kind of a heartwarming uh, message that we got, and we've been getting a lot of these from our um, patients and our community, and really just want to thank our communities for all their support and encouragement. It means a lot to our staff, and if you can see this up on your screen, uh, this is from um, uh, Madison, uh, eight years old from Fargo, who sent a thank you to the doctors, nurses, and staffs about the very, very good job we're doing. So thank you, Madison, for sharing that. It's very heartwarming for all of us. And finally, as Dr. Griffin said, also just want to continue to thank our communities for all the uh, donations uh, that we've been receiving, over 4,700 cloth masks, and again, would offer or ask you to continue to send those. Uh, and then also for the food and monetary donations to support our staff as well. Uh, thank you so much for all your support. Thank you, Dr. Griffin and Dr. Vetter. Throughout this COVID-19 pandemic, the City of Fargo continued to offer top-notch services in our metro residents. We are truly in the process of re-energizing our facilities to be public beginning 
on Monday, May 4th. I know some people are a uh, little uneasy about reopening at this time, and I want them to know our concerns, their concerns are heard. We are working closely with North Dakota Department of Health and the Governor's Office to conduct more testing in our county and to identify curves of this virus so we can continue to flatten the curve. And today's numbers are excellent. It's 2.3% of the people tested positive. That's one of the lowest amount we've had for a long time. The same conversations and concerns about reopening at the beginning of May would likely have been raised if we were discussing it in June or July reopening. There is simply no perfect time. It is important not to rush into anything as we venture towards our new normal. I'm working closely with the Fargo departments and the division heads across the organizations to implement an appropriate and effective measures to safely reintegrate the public into our operations in a timely manner. Our reopening effort will consist of a phased approach to ensure we're responsibly rebooting the city. The first phase involves strategies encouraging safe interactions, such as utilization with teleconferencing in lieu of face-to-face -face meeting, floor signage to keep members of the public six feet apart, and shift rotations to keep staff members protected as much as possible. Progression beyond the first phase of reopening will be driven by data indicating that we're making progress in the slowdown of the Corona-19 viruses, hospitalizations, and loss of life. It is ultimately in the hands of the people to determine when we reopen further. If we continue to do the, th the suggestions we've all given you, we should be able to more and more as time goes on. And now I'd like to introduce the West Fargo Commissioner President, Bernie Dardis, to talk about West Fargo. Thank you, Mayor Mahoney. And I'd also like to thank your staff, Ty and Greg, for their work on hosting this event every week. Uh, they do a great job and we're very fortunate to have the city of Fargo uh, facilitate this, this meeting with the public. Before I start my comments, uh, I would also like to tell the public that how fortunate we are to have the healthcare professionals that we have in our community, and certainly the public health officials that we have in our communities. Mrs. McKay and Mrs. Fleming do an amazing job. And just for the public's knowledge, Mrs. Fleming on our side of the river, on the North Dakota side of the river, takes time out of every morning and sits with us at 745 every morning and gives us the newest updates, newest guidance, newest suggestions, and newest concerns. So to cast public health, a special shout out for the, all the work you're doing. I know that you're working Saturdays, you're working Sundays, and you're working very, very long days. And our communities as a whole are grateful to both uh, Clay Public Health and Cass Public Health uh, on all the work you're doing to make, protect our citizens. As the North Dakota Smart Restart Plan begins, the City of West Fargo would like to share with, that our staff is finalizing a phased return to work plan also for our employees as well as for the public. The timing is, depending on our, it is dependent on our ability to ensure our public buildings are properly supplied, set up, and regularly clean to protect staff and the public. I'd like to encourage the community to visit NorthDakotaResponse.gov. That's NorthDakotaNDResponse.gov for information on the plan, phases, and guidelines for re reopening our businesses that are closed. We want to start our businesses and their customers to be familiar with the protocols so we can support each other as much as possible. As a city, we are excited to get those businesses reopened, but the state of North Dakota will still institute critical guidelines to continue our successful manage of COVID-19. The phase, the first phase of North Dakota Smart Restart includes universal protocols and specific guidelines for the businesses previously closed that will control gathering size, physical distancing, workplace activity, hygiene, cleaning and special measure for the type special measures for the type of business keeping in mind we will always take the advice of the healthcare professional and public health visit www.northdakotandresponse.gov to read about those protocols i want one thing also to be remembered and that this does not change the current public health guidelines to protect good hygiene of washing your hands practice the social distancing, and stay home if you are sick, 
to minimize the spread of COVID-19. The City of West Fargo will work to share the information and updates from North Dakota Smart Restart on Facebook, Twitter, Nextdoor, and LinkedIn. Residents should also follow the Fargo Cast Public Health, the North Dakota Department of Health, the North Dakota Department of Commerce, and North Dakota Response to keep up with the latest on public health and commerce. I'd also like to send a shout out to uh, all of the professionals that, are, that share this venue every week. Dr. Griffin, Dr. Vetter, Commission, uh, uh, Cass County Commission Chairman Chad Peterson, of course, Public Health, Mr. Haney from Clay County, and, and Mayor Judd from Moorhead, and of course, Mayor Mahoney from Fargo. Your leadership and your steadfastness on protecting our citizens is an inspiration to me as being uh, a new entry into public service. I thank you for your service, and I appreciate very much the ability to work with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Dardis. Our next speaker is Moorhead Mayor Jonathan Judd. Uh, thank you, Mayor Mahoney. Uh, I got a few uh, shout outs here, but I uh, also I want to begin just by saying um, a big debt of uh, gratitude to our city staff. Uh, city uh, services are, are functioning and operational and they're doing a great job uh, serving our residents. So I just want to uh, recognize uh, city manager Christina Volkers and her staff for continuing a job well done. Uh, also, uh, as far as an update goes, Governor Walls did announce last week that the K-12 school systems in Minnesota and in Moorhead will continue distance learning for the remainder of the academic year. Uh, I do want to send a uh, shout out to the students and the teachers uh, for their work and their effort uh, in order to maintain our uh, learning curriculum and also to Superintendent Lunick. But I, I do want to send a sincere special shout out to the class of 2020. I saw on uh, social media, there were a lot of tears being shed uh, based on the fact that there's a lot of, uh, well, obviously all those students from that class that will not have a graduation ceremony, at least at, at this point. So, you know, I want you to know that we're all thinking of you. Uh, we are very much dedicated to your success here in the city. So I just want you to know that uh, we greatly appreciate the hard work and effort that you've done to this point in order to secure your graduation status. Uh, also, Minnesota stay at home order is set to expire Monday, May 4th. Uh, we expect that Governor Walls may offer some additional guidance uh, on this order uh, before Monday. Non-critical businesses in Minnesota, including industrial and manufacturing businesses and office-based businesses whose work is primarily not customer facing began reopening on April 26th with health and safety protocols as provided by Governor Walz's executive order. Also an MPS Moorhead Public Service update, as eligible Moorhead businesses are reopening, uh, MPS is reminding businesses to check the private water services within their buildings. Uh, while Moorhead's municipal water system is safe, it continues to be monitored on a regular basis. Water systems within buildings that have been closed for a prolonged period should be flushed to uh, ensure water quality. MPS will be sharing CDC guidance for businesses on this subject today on the MPS website and via other forms of communication. I'll like to close uh, my updates uh, by sharing uh, my Moorhead pride in our fire department and the sewing skills of some very crafty Moorhead residents who donated 764 face masks last Saturday. The effort was part of a statewide drive by fire departments to collect masks to be made available for congregate care facilities. And also Clay uh, County Commissioner Haney will touch on the impact of these masks a bit more in his remarks. But I too would like to close uh, to <clears throat> say a big thank you to all of you uh, sitting on this call, uh, for those of you that are listening, for our residents, for your strength, your resilience, and for your work, and all being uh, a part of a team effort to get through this together. So with that, I'll pass it back to you, Mayor Mahoney. Thank you, Jonathan. Next speaker is Cass County President Chair uh, Chad Peterson. 
Thank you, Mayor. Uh, working on my glare here a little bit, still there, but uh, give me some time. I'll figure this out sooner or later. So with that, thank you to everyone self-quarantining, working from home, and socially distancing. As always, a special thank you to all the city and county staff, first responders, healthcare workers, as well as, most importantly, the business owners and staff patiently waiting for Friday to arrive. Your government within Cass County is still doing our part, the courthouse. Cass County is still open by appointment only. We have paper face masks available upon entry of the county buildings. We're asking the public to wear these disposable masks or bring one of your own when visiting county offices. Public meeting attendance continues to be held, continues to be held remotely. You can view these meetings through links on our website, cascountynd.gov. The jail. The jail currently has 139 in custody, three COVID positive, all three are in negative airflow cells. Sheriff John is working with state agencies, state's attorney, offices, judges to come up with a plan for reopening. These leaders will determine how and when we're going to fully reopen the court system and what that might look like going forward. Elections. If people don't receive an application for ballot directly from the Secretary of State's office by the end of this week, you can go online to www.vote.nd.gov. Again, that is a very important address, vote.nd.gov, and fill out, print, sign, and mail your application to the county auditor. You can also call the county auditor's office directly at 241-5600, again, 241-5600, and we'll mail you an application for the June 9th primary. For more information about elections, you can go to cascountynd.gov backslash, backslash elections. Once again, we're still providing all county services. The public can find information on these things like veteran services, economic assistance, uh, family services, along with everything else we do at the county level at cascountynd.gov. Or stay up to date with any changes we have on our Twitter and Facebook accounts. As we get ready for the next step on Friday, I want to share a couple thoughts. This isn't about me or anyone on this call. It's not about the courthouses or city halls. The government has never had the power to stop this. Our medical facilities can only provide you help when you get sick while searching for a cure. We can advise, counsel, we can share what we're learning, but the reality is this. The power to get through this is and, uh, and has always been in your hands your family, your neighbors, co-workers. Please be smart. Please make good choices. Please follow the guidelines set forth by leaders and healthcare professionals. If we do these things, we'll eventually be able to move on to the next step and return to normalcy. And again, thank you for everyone for putting up with all the stress this brings. We're going to get through this. We're North Dakota, Minnesota proud, and we'll continue to be that way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chad. Very much enjoyed the last part of your speech as well. Our last speaker is Clay County Commissioner Vice Chair Jim Haney. Thank you, Dr. Mahoney. On April 27th, Governor Tim Walz enacted an executive order allowing workers in certain non-critical sectors to return to safe workplaces. This executive order allows industrial, manufacturing, and office-based businesses to return to work. These workplaces generally do not involve direct interactions with customers or the general public. The reopening required workplaces to create a COVID-19 preparedness plan that follows the Center for Disease Control and Minnesota Department of Health guidelines, as well as OSHA standards. Businesses must follow health and safety protocols that are outlined in the order and conduct health screenings of their workers. Teleworking is encouraged to continue as much as possible. This order allows for approximately 80 to 100,000 employees across the state to safely return to work. The Clay County government buildings will remain closed to the public until at least May 4th, which is the end of Governor Walz's stay at home order. The county is working on a phased opening plan for government services. Some staff will continue to telework and plans are being developed for when and how more staff will return to the county buildings. State and national guidelines will be followed. The public will receive ongoing notification as phased government services are implemented. Throughout this pandemic, Clay County has been supporting our community partners, and we will continue to do so. The Clay County Sheriff's Department is providing grocery and pharmacy delivery services for those in need and living in rural Clay County. 
Residents who are interested in this service must be over 60 years of age or those with underlying health conditions. Residents must call their grocery store or pharmacy to, pur to purchase items, then contact the Sheriff's Department at 218-299-5151 to request a delivery. This service is available Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. We appreciate everyone in our communities for being diligent and following the public health guidelines during this pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Mahoney. Thank you, Jim. And that ends our discussions today. Thank you, everybody who was tuning in. Uh, be smart, keep doing the things you have been doing up to this time. I think our community has been doing a great job taking on this virus and we'll continue to do that. Thank you.